Good. All right, let's uh, do the the podcast intro yes sir yeah well we're rolling already so wow. we can get right into it hey uh, citizens you are listening to the podcast edition of this special edition of the thomas jefferson hour about among other things death for jefferson and the death of my mother she was an extraordinary woman as you will hear from this uh podcast and although i was not really wanting to talk about it you david said let's do yes well, your mother was a fascinating woman. Like I said in the show, I met her maybe half a dozen to a dozen times. And um, she certainly, she more than carried herself. She had a bit of an aura about her. And um, Her nickname was The Hammer. You relate a story where she babbled, as you said. Um, On an and, opioid after an operation. Yeah. Anyway, we talk about, we talk a lot about your mom. We talk about you. We talk a lot about your daughter. And uh, we also talk about Jefferson and death and uh, some of the correspondence. And so I would say um, we should leave it at that and let listeners uh, listen to this program. Um, before we go, though, I would just like to say. Oh, boy. If you enjoy the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and I know there are some of you listening who do because we get your mail and read every piece of it. You can help the Jefferson Hour to survive and to thrive by going to jeffersonhour.com. Click on Donate. You can help us further the show that way. You can become a 1776 Club member and get some fun extras. And we really do just appreciate your support. It all goes to the show. We're not buying cars or TVs. We're not taking anything, actually. It all goes no, to the show. No, I can't even buy cable. Without your listenership and your support, we are nothing. David, let me in indulge our listeners with just this one little piece. Go right ahead. Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson, is one of my favorite literary figures. He was an 18th century man. He produced the first great dictionary of the English language in 1755. He wrote The Lives of the Poets, one of the greatest biographical series of introductions to the great poets of the English language. He also edited Shakespeare. He was maybe the greatest conversationalist of all time. And his lackey and 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 protege, James Boswell, took down uh, Johnson's conversation. And here's a little piece I looked up the other day because it it was it was beloved of my father. My father came to Johnson and Boswell thanks to me during my time at Oxford. And he and I laughed many times at this. And it's about the perspective on death. So here this is Boswell. I told Johnson that I had dined lately at Foote's, who showed me a letter which he had received from Tom Davies, telling him that he had not been able to sleep from the concern he felt on, quote, this sad affair of Beretti, a man who was to be hanged, begging of him to try if he could su suggest anything that might be of service, and in the same letter, recommending to him an industrious young man who kept a pickle shop. Johnson, aye, sir, here you have a specimen of human sympathy, a friend hanged and a cucumber pickled. We know not whether Beretti or the pickle man has kept Davies from his sleep, nor does he know himself. And as to his not sleeping, sir, Tom Davies is a very great man. Tom has been upon stage and knows how to do these things. I have not been upon stage and cannot do such things. Boswell, I have often blamed myself, sir, for not feeling for others as sensibly as many say they do. Johnson, sir, don't be duped by any of them. You will find these very feeling people are not very ready to do you any good. They pay you by feeling. A man hanged and a cucumber pickled, David. That's the nature of life. We trivialize it and we make it profound in the same paragraph. And with that, let's go to this week's show. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for indulging us in this very personal edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're joined this week on the Thomas Jefferson Hour by the creator of the Jefferson Hour, the gentleman seated across from me now, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Good day to you, my friend. It is the midsummer of 2018 on the Northern Great Plains, and I can tell you this, if we do not get hail, <laughs> I'm going to have one of the best tomato crops I've ever had. Me too, but I'm looking for some wood to knock on <laughs> we've had at my house i don't know about yours we live within two miles of each other at my house we've had two just ferocious thunderstorms yep, yep, yep. and in each case i thought here it comes because last year i was actually at the movies with my daughter who was visiting oh, i remember that and we had just a sock dollager of a storm and it hailed out my tomatoes and they sock were shredded dollager i a, like that a word. sock dollager and they it shredded my tomatoes they recovered but i only had 
I suppose, 500 tomatoes last year when I would have had maybe 5,000, certainly 2,500. Well, we will have to revisit gardening in the next few weeks. And uh, those who don't like our gardening talks, I'm giving you fair warning. But, but some do. You know, I some think like we're getting them. more that do. Um, but, yes, it's go- it's going to be fun to uh, to revisit the the Hoolier, uh dwarf tomatoes. Oh, and, yes. And the, How are yours the, doing? They're just... God, they're just stout little fellows doing great. And uh, the Klee Labs Is anything well. red in your garden? Just about. By the time this show airs, hopefully. Uh, mine are still uh, in a state of high green. I wanted to talk to you today because I don't want to say there's been a tragedy in your life. That's not really accurate. Um, there's been a normal course of events that in its way is tragic. I'm stumbling here, but... Oh, well, what, you, what you're referring to, of course, is that my mother, uh, Mill Strauss Jenkinson, uh, died on uh, Monday the 9th of July, 2018. I actually was in London, and I got a call from my daughter uh, and from the hospital saying that uh, my mother, who was 86, had been rushed to the hospital, uh, having headaches and, and uh, being unresponsive, breathing, uh, but not um, able to wake up. And so within a few hours, she was dead. Uh, people don't need to be um, uh, very upset by that. They don't know my mother. Well, that's kind of what I was hoping, is we could devote some time this week to talk about her. I I met her a couple of times, well, more than a couple of times, um, enough to know uh, where some of your character came from, frankly, sir, and uh, I, I'd like maybe I could share a, a couple things as well. Of course, let me start um, by saying this: that uh, I'm celebrating my mother. Uh, she was a strong, vibrant, independent, smart, funny, often sarcastic person, the most autonomous person that I ever knew. Uh, in the last twenty some years, she's been a widow. She didn't say, oh, please come and change a light bulb or there's a cricket in the basement or, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. she she didn't need any of that. Forgive uh, me for laughing, but I, I yes. <laughs> she was a strong, strong woman and, she and was. fiercely independent. She led a, a beautiful, long, extraordinary life. She was, she was, with all of her mental faculties right up to the end, her body was just barely beginning to let her down as, as everybody does. Uh, and she didn't look forward to decrepitude. And I remember saying to her many times in the last eight or nine years, David, Mother, don't grow old. She would do something that an old person does. And I'd say, do not grow old. And, she would, and she'd look at me and say, I know, I know, I won't, I won't. Uh, I remember the first time I met her. And, and she knew who I was and knew the connection I had to you doing the show. And she looked me up and down, and it was, I guess what I'm saying is, she looked out for her her boy. She was kind of like, all right, are you uh, good enough to be doing this? Oh, please. No, it wasn't, it wasn't like any awful judgmental thing. Maybe it was, am I good enough to be your friend? No, 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 no. She was looking at, you know, I was like, who is this new fellow in Clay's Um. life? I need to, and and I I remember the last time I saw her was... uh, at, uh, it was one of those rare times I got out of the house and went to a, a gathering at your house. My daughter suggested we have a birthday party for my mother and a birthday party for herself. And I walked in, and she knew, who, of course, who I was. And we immediately began this delightful conversation about your daughter. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, uh, Sometimes a guest host on this program. Uh, she was a force, she just put it that a, way. Yeah, A sycophant, I think she called you once, my daughter. But, yeah, not your mother. No, my mother would call you a nitwit or a knucklehead. That would be high praise, I right. understand. You you had a, um, a, a beautiful post um, uh, about the relationship between your mother and your daughter. That is, uh, we, we need to share that on the Thomas Jefferson Hour page at... That's jeffersonhour.com, but uh, it was just a, uh, my wife and I read it, and she was so moved by it. Well, I'm happy to do that, actually, because it was the maybe the strangest thing that I ever saw in my life. You know, but grandmothers and granddaughters are often very close, uh, but this was different. This was some sort of deep, mutual, 
love, admiration, friendship. Yeah, let me quote from that article. She said, uh, out of the blue, this was about five years ago, and she it shocked you. She said, quote, I just adore Catherine. Adore is the only word I can think of to do it justice. To which I said, give it time, mother. <laughs> give, give it time, which is my <laughs> standard response. I'm setting you up. But yes, so there was something kind of electric, conspiratorial, deep and profound between them. And, you know, my... My daughter is a wonderful young woman. She looked up to her grandmother as kind of a standard of character and strength. Fair enough. That's I think, uh, says a lot about m- my mother. But what, what really surprised me was my mother's regard for Catherine. My mother is, is not a sentimentalist. She's not a typical grandmother with caramel rolls and pies and so on. She's detached. Well, I have trouble believing that to the core. Do you know what I mean? Believing what to the core? That she was not a sentimentalist. She might have had it deep in there, but boy, she had a crust. She didn't show it, yeah. You know, and, and I, I know people are going to object to what I'm about to say, but just stay with me. She was Germanic, and there was a kind of a Prussian in her. And if she had been alive in 1939, she would have invaded Poland. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. <laughs> That's pretty good. She would have been in the in the avant in the vanguard of the Polish occupation. Well, after reading this, uh, my wife Jan said it best in that both of them were very lucky, and I was lucky to look on and see this, and I knew enough to stay out of it. Both as a father and a son, I was thrilled, and I, I always shook my head a little because my mother, I have to say, did not make it easy. She was a very, very strong individual. And and as you know, as people grow older, they think that they have been given a license to say whatever they feel like saying. <laughs> I haven't hit that point yet. I'm looking forward and to it. And my mother sort of <laughs> took that on in her 40s. Uh-huh. But sometimes things that came out of her mouth, I mean, we, here, I'll give you an example. My daughter and I went to U-Haul to buy boxes and tape and so on to help um, pack up mother's effects. And this young woman, this great young woman at U-Haul with uh, two nose piercings and tattoos, very smart, very funny. And so I said, I need some boxes. And she said, here's what you want. And I said, she said, what kind of tape are you going to want? And I said, well, I, I think I need plastic tape. And she said, no, no, I think you really would rather have paper tape. And I said, no, plastic. She said, no, it's going to be paper. And then we got up and she said, I think you should rent a storage facility. And I said, Okay. And when we got out of there, she talked me into spending way more than I want, but everything was a smart decision. And she had guided me through this and given me the best deals on everything. When we got out, my daughter in the car said, you know what grandma would have said to her? She would have said, my, you're pesky. You know? <laughs> and she was right. My mother would have would have said to this young woman, my, you're pesky, and gotten away with it. If I said that, the woman would have sued me. My mother had... There was some way that she could cut through and tell truths as she understood them, not always the right truths, and people took it because there was something in her character that led them to accept it from her when they wouldn't have accepted it from you or from me or from somebody else. She spent a great deal of her life teaching. She was for 20-some years an English teacher at Dickinson High School in Dickinson, North Dakota. And you mentioned in one of your writings that there's scarcely a week that goes by that somebody doesn't come up and recall that she was their teacher. Yeah, someone comes up and says, oh, um, are you Clay Jenkinson? Yeah. Oh, I had your mother at Dickinson High School, and I always give exactly the same answer. I say, I commiserate with you. (laughs) And uh, there are uh, a number of different names that she— Her nickname was The Hammer. Uh Uh-huh. She was called The Hammer. That must have had an effect on you, having a mom as a teacher. Well, we went, you no, know, I was a high school student while she was a high school teacher. And this was, I won't go into it, but this was a difficult time in our family life. And so <laughs> we would drive to school in my father's uh, car, which was a Chrysler New Yorker. Oh, my. And we would park. And then I would go in one door and she would go in another. And uh-huh. when it was slippery, she'd say, you have to take my elbow. And I would I would put the the minimum amount of human pinch on the <laughs> coat, not on her elbow, but on the coat. And uh-huh. the minute we got through the door, I would sprint away. But it was mutual. Don't get me wrong. Her view was, what did I do to deserve to have to teach both of my children in high school classes? We were terrible children. 
my mother somehow endured us. We were, you know, you, I think listeners to the Jefferson Hour know that there's kind of a smart aleck in me, a deep irreverence. And my sister made me look like a church boy. And so my mother's view was, can't they go to some other school? Do we have to go to the same school? So she endured a lot. And, I'm, you know, the picture that I'm drawing here is of maybe someone who would be considered um, bossy or overbearing. She wasn't. She never got in my face, never in my life. My mother and I were, in many respects, best friends, David. We went all over the world together. She was a Lewis and Clark lover, sometimes a Lewis and Clark presenter. We've been to the White House together. We were at the Millennium in Washington, D.C., where I performed for Bill Clinton together. We've been, we've done many, many things from the Mediterranean to Alaska with deep harmony and joy. But I went to my house and she went to hers and we didn't interfere in each other's lives. And you know what? That worked perfectly. I think that's, uh, that, 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 that's a good formula for success in family relationships to know your space, right? I adored my father. I worshipped my father. He died 24 years ago. My mother didn't worship him, and she didn't worship me. She seems to have worshipped my child. But she had a healthy skepticism about her son, which I think is the only way to survive him. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week on the Jefferson Hour, we're taking some time to talk about Clay's mother, Mill Jenkinson, a a phenomenal woman, really. Uh, She lived in the same house in Dickinson for 50 years. She did. Or thereabouts, right? We had the same phone number (laughs) for 51 years. I could recite it now. And whenever I call her now, thank goodness for cell phones, because (laughs) I would have called the number in, in Dickinson. We lived in a house that looked a bit like a barn, one of the earliest houses in, in Dickinson, North Dakota. She made it her own. It was kind of a show place. Uh, but a year ago, I said to her, look, there are 3,000 square feet in this house. It leaks like a sieve in the winter. Uh, it needs a new foundation. The garage is detached. Let's sell this place and move you into some place where you never have to shovel snow. You never have to do the lawn. And she readily agreed. It wasn't one of those moments where the child has to bully the parent into downsizing. And thank goodness we did. So we took, a friend of mine and I took five gigantic, I mean gigantic loads of trash to the city landfill in Dickinson. That was another weird adventure. It's like going into Dante's Inferno. (laughs) But then I moved her to Bismarck on the hottest day in human history um, and the crew didn't come so one person and I had to load all of her things into this apartment but just a few weeks ago David she said to me you know what I'm happier than I've ever been in my life really yeah I'm, I love this apartment I love living in Bismarck she has this boyfriend named Russ who lives in New Brighton Minnesota they see each other about three months per year and she said I am happier than I have ever been and I was just so that was so delightful I came across a Benjamin Franklin quote. Okay. Many people die at 25 and aren't buried until they are 75. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty good. No, she she said to me when I moved her, she said, I am going to be carried out of this place feet first. She was alive till the end. She was alive. I Last week, I went to London. I had to go um, uh, for some uh, important reasons, and she was going to take me to the airport. And she texted me that morning, said, I'm not up to it. And I was shocked. That was the first time in her long life that she wasn't up to something. And I had a little teeny premonition, but I thought, no, she's indomitable. And so then I was in London when I got the call that she um, that she was rushed to the hospital. I wasn't able to get back in time to say goodbye. But I'll tell you this, David. My daughter flew out, the great Catherine. She picked me up at the airport the next day when I was um, – um, you know, in the worst kind of uh, bewilderment, grief, and also um, uh, jet lagged. And then the following morning, we went to the funeral home where my mother would be cremated because to see her. I didn't want to do this. I had seen my father when he died. He was sallow and gray and shriveled up, and it was a it was tough. And so I didn't want to do this. And my daughter said, "No, we're we're doing it." So we went in. 
and she was there lying on this table in this room, in this funeral home, and my daughter said, she looks like Eva Perone. She looked majestic. My mother was in command of death. We looked at her, and she looked magnificent, powerful and confident and almost smiling. And I said, I'm, I think she's going to wake up and say, my, the wallpaper in here is bad. She, she looked fantastic. And so then she was cremated later that day, and my daughter and I took the ashes to Fergus Falls, Minnesota, where my mother grew up, and spread a few on the farm, which she, she walked, believe me, she walked away from that farm and was never going back. And she looked on my love of the agrarian as kind of a pathetic hobby by somebody who never milked a cow. So we spread a few ashes there. We took some to the cemetery. Now I'm taking a few on the Missouri River to the White Cliffs this week because she loved Lewis and Clark. She was just, That was one of her favorite historical narratives. So it was great. She went out as she came. She was healthy, and then one day she wasn't. She never spent a night in the hospital. Uh, she never suffered. There was no pain. It was perfect. And people are saying to me, why aren't you more broken up? And I said, you ha- if you knew my mother, this is precisely how she wanted to go. Overnight, no pain, not a lot of people holding her hand, no flowers. You're the one who brought it up. We're children until we lose our parents. Now I have to grow up. Well, maybe. I don't know. You know, that's something that all of us face. We're one more up in the chain of mortality, I guess. Well, that's it. So I have no sister. She died two years ago. Uh, I have one child. She's very much alive and an incredible child. Uh, no cousins. Uh, no uncles or aunts. No, well, I have a, a, a grandnephew and a couple of nieces. Uh, but that's it. It's a teeny tiny gene pool. And not to get too serious about this, but I'm the last person named Jenkinson. My daughter, unless she keeps that name, will marry somebody and probably take his name. That's kind of an odd thing that happens to us males, and I think it's sort of wired into us, don't you? And I'm not vain about it. I don't think, oh, the Jenkinsons must carry on. I don't feel that at all. And it would be a really sexist thing to feel since I have a, a tremendous daughter. You have to be really careful about that because it's it's not really right, but... You know, to deny that it's there in some deep recesses. Well, you know, if Theodore Roosevelt were here, we'd say, you had a duty to provide young children, males, who would carry on the family line. He he would be unrelenting and saying, oh, no, this is not about false humility. You have a duty to maintain yeah, your family line. Yeah, which is nonsense. And, of and course. There still is that that thing. But being the last of the Jenkinsons, and, and now I'm the patriarch of the family, oh, which my. is so pathetic. Um, And I'm the eldest in the family. There's a certain, I mean, the one between me and death has gone. And you have to, I've been, I'm 63. I started hearing the clock when I was 60. I don't know about you, but when on my 60th birthday, for the first time, I could hear the clock. And I've been thinking, how do I want to spend the last 30 years of my life? What do I want to achieve? Where do I want to visit? Who are my friends? What kind of a community do I want? What do I still want to read? You know, you have to start thinking you're not 30 anymore. You're not even 50 anymore. You, their Mortality is now in the room. But there was one person between me and death, and that was my incredibly alive and vibrant mother. She's gone, and so now I have no choice but to think, all right, I'm almost certainly next. That could be 30 years from now, but there is nobody in my genetic line between me uh, and the end. And so that, I hope, I hope, David, that that will liberate creative juices and will make me think about what I really want to achieve. And let me just close by this by saying this, that a friend of mine named Jonathan who went to Japan, spent two years there, came back and I said, what did you learn? And he said, I'll tell you the most important thing I can ever tell you. If the water table is 100 feet deep, it doesn't matter how many 98 foot wells you drill. Think of that. If the water table is 100 feet deep, it does not matter how many 98-foot wells you drill. You only hit water or oil or success, achievement, if you drill down to the depth of whatever resource you're looking for. And boy, is that right. You know, when you're 40, you think, oh, I've got all the time in the world. That's a realization that we 
both of us, I'm sure, wish we would have had when we were 20. <laughs> well, but you won't, at 20, you don't believe it. Yeah. But when you're 60 or beyond and you have to hear the clock from time to time and you realize that, you know, depending on your religious view, that when you die, your legacy is the effect you've had on people. And boy, did my mother have an effect on people. I have had more than a thousand. This this vindicates Zuckerberg. I wrote something about her death. I had 600 replies, I mean, texts, people who could never have known that she had died from all over the world. And then it's six degrees of separation. So one person in Billings, Montana learns or Seattle or Tacoma or, or Tampa, and then it spreads into their network. And suddenly this outpouring, more than a thousand people in the last week have contacted me and it saved me an enormous amount of postage stamps trying to figure out who's where and how do I get to them. It's amazing, but I'll tell you this. She had an impact. There's a famous John Donn quotation um, from one of his sermons. I wish I had it in memory. He says, your life matters. He said, don't live as if your hand went through a basin of water and came out the other side and had no effect on it, or except possibly to sully it a little. He said, you must not be the hand moving through the basin of water. You must do something that matters in the world, that in friendship— in family, in love, in religion, whatever it is, in, in, in your work, you must do something that that means you, you took you took life seriously and you gave to some community outside of yourself something worth having. It's a painting for some people. It's winning a marathon and inspiring young women. It's teaching and and telling people language matters and grammar matters and literature matters. It's it's the Thomas Jefferson hours saying this country is worth agonizing over. This country is better than we're being right now. This country has an important destiny which we are degrading, not just the president, but we as a people are degrading. You have to live as if something's at stake beyond pizza and beer and a jet ski. You have to live as if life matters and when you get to be our age and you see mortality, you think, okay, okay, if I had to measure myself today, what is the impact of my life? Have I made the world better or have I just used up some of the carbon? And I think that's a question that everybody needs to ask. You should ask it at 20. You don't. But if you don't ask it at 60, you're nuts because – the, but done is right. There is no excuse from just being a consumer of resources and dying without having a positive impact on the world around you. You know, thinking about our, our conversation today, I, I couldn't help but go to Jefferson a little bit. He's our man. Well, you're the one who uh, exposed me to some of the incredible correspondence that occurred around the issue of death. There, there was a letter that um, uh, Jefferson wrote to John Adams when Abigail died. One of the greatest letters ever written. Yeah, I think I, I think I gave it to you. It's in front of you. Yes, I do. It's dated November 13th, 1818. This is such a great letter. And, and Adams wrote back and said, this was one of the best letters ever written. Jefferson writes, and, I, and I'm going to quote it in its entirety. The public papers, my dear friend, announced the fatal event of which your letter of October the 20th had given me ominous foreboding. Tried myself in the school of affliction by the loss of every form of connection which can rive the human heart. I know well and feel what you have lost, what you have suffered, are suffering, and have yet to endure. The same trials have taught me that for ill so immeasurable, time and silence are the only medicine. I will not, therefore, by useless condolences, open afresh the sluices of your grief, nor, although mingling sincerely my tears with yours, Will I say a word more, where words are vain, but that it is of some comfort to us both that the term is not very distant at which we are to deposit in the same cerement our sorrows and suffering bodies, and to ascend in essence to an ecstatic meeting with friends we have loved and lost, and whom we shall still love and never lose again. God bless you and support you under your heavy affliction. Yours humbly. 
uh, Thomas Jefferson. What a great letter. Yeah, I, I had to find that for this discussion. I, you, but I wasn't. you said that Adams responded to this? It's just that this is, uh, he wrote the perfect letter, Mr. Jefferson. And let me just look at it for a minute. I don't mean to be uh, snarky at all, but I doubt that Jefferson believed that there would be an ecstatic reunion in heaven. Jefferson was a materialist and, a, and, and he was a physicist, not a metaphysicist. He believed that the soul was corpuscular and probably when we died, well, that's it. I, you know, I, 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 there's a, a popular song called Walking in Memphis. I forget the artist. The, the scenario of the song is that this young man is, you know, walking in the, in the footsteps of these great artists in Memphis. And he ends up in a spiritual situation in a church with a, uh, a choir that he is just moved by. And the lyric uh, is, uh, the, the preacher says, uh, tell me, son, are you a Christian? And he says, ma'am, I am tonight. <laughs> so I think for Jefferson, it's kind of like, yes, ma'am, I am tonight. And Jefferson was never quite certain. He was not an atheist. He was not He was an agnostic. He was a deist. At times, he seems to have thought there might be an afterlife. At other times, he was skeptical. I think his reason was skeptical. His heart was more willing to believe. But whatever is the case... When you're writing a letter to one of your closest friends who's just lost their spouse, this is not a time to you know to quibble about metaphysics and about the, the afterlife. But Jefferson says, you know, time and silence, time and silence, that's all you have. Again, Jefferson and death, you look at um, the story of when he lost his wife and um, he and Patsy became so close. Uh, there's some quotation about she was the only one who witnessed the depth of his of his sorrow. She said 50 years later, I can hardly think about it because it was so pronounced. His wife died on September 6, 1782. Uh, Jefferson had effectively a breakdown. His daughter Patsy was nine, I think. Well, it's reported that when she died, he fainted dead away. And they thought he, he might be dead for a time. Now, uh -huh. some of this is Shandian pose. Jefferson was not above, I mean, this sounds so cruel, but he was not above a certain pose. Everyone does this in social life. I'm just, it was a deeply effective breakdown. No, I'm not. I'm not doubting that. But, but whether he fainted and was thought to maybe have died, I think is probably pushing it a little. But whatever is the case, that easily could be he collapsed. Right. He that fainted. became that he fainted. Right. That became that, these stories you know. grow. But but. I'll tell you who's the hero of this story. I mean, there are two. One is Madison, who then said, let's get him out of the country. Let's send him to France. Let's get him out of here, because that's the only way he's going to recover. And he was right. Jefferson then spent five years in France. But the real hero is Martha, Patsy. She, she grew up that day and became Jefferson's companion in life. Yeah, I, I really suspected that. Um, it's good to hear you reinforce that, um, that, that the gravity of the situation, she rose to it and, and said, I'm going to look out for my father. And the bond that happened then in the fall of 1782 carried them through the rest of his life. She became the number one person in his life to the, I think, to the detriment of her marriage in some ways. She was his, his deepest friend, his companion, his compatriot, his confessor, his daughter. And poor Maria, the second daughter, r realized this, that, that it was Martha, and it was always going to be Martha. And this was, you know, this is the sibling contests and rivalries are in every family. I'll tell you what, when my mother died, I turned to my daughter, and I quoted Jefferson when his daughter Maria died. And he said... In a letter to an old friend, he said, now the evening prospects of my life hang on a single thread. And Catherine said, Jefferson. That's how it is. My daughter is now the single thread of the rest of my life because the other threads have all disappeared. And Catherine understands that. It's a burden. It's an important burden, but it's a burden. And I want to make sure I don't burden her in a way I think Jefferson did. With his daughter, Patsy. Patsy was asking for it, though. She wanted to be in that position, don't you think? My mother would say, get over it. Get over it and get on with your life. No nonsense. We're not going to have it. We're not going to wallow in this. We're going to move on, dot com. That's my mother. 
and Mr. Jefferson couldn't quite do that. He was he was wired differently. I'm I'm my mother's son. Uh, she was a Stoic. I'm a Stoic. She was contemptuous of human frailty. I'm very skeptical of human frailty. She didn't waste a lot of time looking back. I spend more time than she did looking back, but not a lot. She said, shake yourself off, get back on the horse, move on, and appeared to some to be um, without sentiment and maybe without heart. That's not at all true. But her coping mechanism was, let's get busy. When I moved her into her new house, the whole thing was just covered with boxes in every direction, and, and she said, I'll be done by Friday. <laughs> and she was. She was like, in three days, she put everything away. But it would have taken me weeks or months. She did it in three days and said, eh, that's how you do it. We need to take a short break, Clay. We'll uh, continue this conversation after that break. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. But this week, we're having a conversation about a very special woman, Mill Jenkinson, Clay's mother. And it's uh, led to a couple of Jeffersonian things. Uh, Looking up uh, some of the letters that you've presented to me over the years. um, And and then looking into Jefferson when, when he lost his wife and the reaction of his daughter. There, there's a great story about um, the the book that the two of them were reading. Um, oh, there's a novel by Lawrence Stern called Tristram Shandy. It's one of my favorite novels. It was Jefferson's favorite novel in English. He wasn't much of a, of a lover of fiction. And he and his wife had courted over it. They both admired it. And I'm guessing that he persuaded her to like it as much as he did. It's a it's an experimental novel, and I tried to get some Jefferson Hour listeners to read it a couple of years ago, and they gave up. So it's tough. <laughs> me, it's t- me included in that, but I did get into it. It's yeah. tough sledding, but, it but there's a famous passage in it about, about, about time. And what happened was that Jefferson stayed by his wife's side through the whole summer in which it was clear that she was dying. He actually set up a table next to her bedroom and was never out of earshot. But at some point, he went off to do some errand in the fields or the gardens. And when he came back, his wife had written out a part of this passage. And it starts, time wastes too fast. Every letter that I trace with my pen reminds me with what rapidity life follows and so on. And it's about how time soars away from us and and, and eats eats everything. And she get, she stopped writing because apparently – she grew too tired or or she passed out or something. And Jefferson came in and then with his much firmer, exquisite handwriting, he finished the passage. And every time I kiss thy hand a bit ado and every absence, separation which follows it's our prelude to that eternal separation, which we are shortly to make. And so we have this. It's in the rare books room at the University of Virginia Library, Alderman Library. I've seen it. Uh, it's a about a four by four inch piece of paper, and you see her beautiful little frail handwriting on the top, and then Jefferson's just magnificent handwriting on the bottom. And you know, in, in the secular world, this is a sacred relic. This is a relic of that moment in Jefferson's marriage at the end, when it was clear to both of them that, that she was going to die, and she goes back to literature to the humanities, and somehow that deepens this moment. Uh, for them, and uh, he saved this piece of paper. He kept a lock of her hair, a few other personal effects on this piece of paper, and he put them in a secret cabinet in a desk. And after his death, um, this little cache, this relic cache was found, and that now resides in the University of Virginia Library. I've taken cultural tours there. I'm going to be leading a cultural tour to Jefferson's France, and I've taken them to Jefferson's Virginia, which we will do again and we go in and we get to see that, and it is amazing. It takes your breath away because he was not a man who revealed much about his emotional life. He was very stoical and careful about all that, very private. And so when you see these moments, you just have to think, well, this is as close as we're ever going to get to Jefferson's heart. Was Jefferson at home when she be, she fell ill? Or, yes. And wasn't it connected to childbirth? Yes, so she was um, pregnant at least six and maybe more times. There were several miscarriages. She, she, she lost a little of her vitality almost with every birth. Uh, and and by 1782, when she gave birth, I think in May, uh, it was clear that she was not going to recover. 
And, of course, this had to produce feelings of guilt. Um, Jefferson was still a very young man. She died at 33. Um, it's amazing that he was able to really go on because he, he took his marriage so deeply seriously. But, but at that time, it was it was the duty of couples to produce children. It was, I mean, it was expected. It was Plus, there was no effective birth control except abstinence. His wife wanted to, to have children, wanted to produce him a male heir. She never did. And he wanted male heirs. He wanted children. And so of their six children, uh, the only boy died at 17 days, unnamed. Four of his six children died in their young life before their seventh birthday. And then his younger of the two surviving daughters, Maria, Polly, uh, died at the age of 24. And then Martha, his uh, eldest daughter, Patsy, was the only one who survived him. So he knew death. And there's a famous letter he wrote to Adams, and he says, I can accept life. I, I like life. I'm an optimist. I steer my bark with hope ahead and fear astern. He said, I can accept everything about the economy of life except what is the use of grief. He says, tell me, what is the use of grief? I have lost virtually everything that I was born to love. What is the use of grief? And, of course, Adams had no answer except Calvinist nonsense. But Jefferson, it was a spasm of agony that he had buried his best friend Dabney Carr when he was 34. He had buried his favorite sister Jane when she was 24. He had buried his wife at 33, four of his six children, a fifth as a young adult. He had, he had seen death. He said it's like an, it's like an army, just the havoc uh, of, of just a private life. And today, every one of those people would live to be a long, long-term adult. The Jefferson Hour then and now, they had to face things that we just take for granted. You know, one of his daughters died of whooping cough and worms. Today, everyone would survive that yeah. in the first world. Today, we have penicillin. We have antibiotics. We have, we have antisepsis. In his time, they didn't really even know to wash their hands before they did things. It was just a completely different era, primitive, medieval, even pre-medieval in medicine. It was just in the next generation after Jefferson's death, medicine made more advances than it had for the whole of human history. And now, of course— People survived their first, their second, their third major health scare. And my mother probably would have survived her major health scare had she gone in a day earlier and insisted on an MRI. She didn't because she was such a stoic. We now know that she had a hematoma. There was pressure on her brain. Had she insisted on an MRI, they would have given her one, and they probably could have released that pressure. But her view was, hey, here I am. It's a headache. Get over it. No heroic. She had a do not resuscitate will. Everything about my mother was, we're not going to mess around with this thing. You know, one thing I, I didn't ask you is, how'd she feel about living in North Dakota? I have this theory. I think I may have said it to you previously, but I believe there are two types of people. There are accidental North Dakotans, and there are naturalized North Dakotans. Everyone's born somewhere. I was born in Minot, North Dakota. She was born in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Everyone's born somewhere. It's an accident. You could be born anywhere. Um, she came to North Dakota as a young woman. My father was a banker who was transferred here from Minnesota. He was born in Detroit Lakes, a resort town in Minnesota. He never liked North Dakota. He didn't dislike it, but he never left asphalt. He never traveled on gravel. He never camped out. He never fished. He never hiked. He, you know, he was he was the opposite of, of what I take to be my own character. He was a very um, protective man, cautious, and he didn't like the outdoors much, and he didn't ever bond with North Dakota. I was lucky as a young man, uh, my great mentor, Mike Jacobs, who, of the Dickinson Press, used to take me out of school. I was a photographer, and, and I would go with him all over western North Dakota to photograph things and to meet ranchers and to hike. and to. He would tell me different types of grass in the grasslands and all the wildflowers. And, you know, he, he really, as Jefferson would say, set the destinies of my life. Well, my mother was a high school teacher, and she was discontented, and she said she loved cowboys. She loved westerns. She loved Louis L'Amour. She, she loved— the Virginian. She loved all Westerns, beginning with uh, Fenimore Cooper. And she applied for a grant to do a, a slide tape program back when that was oh, a form. I remember that. Yeah. On cowboys and ranchers. And she got it to her utter surprise. And so I took her around for two summers to all these ranches in the Little Missouri Valley. We camped. She didn't like that very much, but she did it. 
and we made this stew I call Remarkable Stew, and we talked about life and God and relationships and my father and everything under the stars and listened to coyotes. And she became no longer an accidental North Dakotan, but a naturalized North Dakotan. And she, if, you, if she were here, she would say, that thing, doing that program with my son, was the single greatest experience of my life because it changed her from someone who happened to live in North Dakota to someone who embraced North Dakota. And she was my cheerleader for my own life as a hiker and a camper and a want, someone who wanders out in thunderstorms and, and all the things that I love to do, the Little Missouri, the Missouri, um, the, the prolonged hikes and so on. My father would say, are you nuts? 5,000 years of civilization and you want to sleep in a tent? Um, but my mother would say, you do that. You do that. And she wouldn't fret too much, although she always said, how will I find you when you die out there? <laughs> she was pretty certain that I was going to get struck by something, a bu- uh, the butt of a rifle or a lightning strike or the teeth of a mountain lion. But her view was, grab it. Be a North Dakotan. Trust yourself. And so that was really, really, really important to her. With that, sir, it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. It's a Tuesday morning in mid-July in North Dakota, a state most of you have never visited. In fact, North Dakota is the least visited of the 50 states, and it's easy to understand why. We have very long and ruthless winters here. I don't mind the cold. The gear is great now, including boots good to 60 below zero. The cars now start on the coldest days, thanks to fuel injection. I even have heated seats in my car. But I do mind the three months of very short days and long nights between Thanksgiving and the Ides of March. I miss the light more than the heat. It's a northern latitude here that bites. We are also pretty isolated up here at the top of the United States on the Canadian border. And our landscape is, for most people, pretty dull. Endless grasslands and wheat fields in every direction. No Grand Tetons, no Yosemite, no Grand Canyon. I met a hotel clerk who said driving through the Great Plains is like sitting in a room staring at wallpaper all day long. That seemed a little harsh, but I laughed out loud. No movie has ever captured the quiet magnificence of the Great Plains. How do you capture the gentle swell of land, the twenty or more variations of tawny gold and russet grass? Stick a video camera in front of the Grand Tetons, and you automatically get something splendid. Set up a camera in eastern Montana— and you get what appears to be an endlessly flat landscape under an endless sky. That excites me, but not those who don't have an eye for the improbable and the almost impossibly subtle. The best way to come to terms with my homeland, the Great Plains, if you ever wish to do that, is to read Willa Cather's magnificent novel, My Antonia. It's about Nebraska, but it's more or less the same story of bewildered immigrants who found themselves in one of the most forbidding places in North America, and slowly, with almost infinite suffering, managed to make it work and fulfill, in a stark, clunky sort of way, the American dream. Or read O.E. Rolvog's epic novel, Giants in the Earth, the study of heroic immigrants who strived under almost unbearable strains. I'm not exactly making a Chamber of Commerce pitch here, am I? Better yet, Google Catherine Meyer's paintings. That's M-E-I-E-R. Catherine Meyer. I first encountered her work at a Willa Cather conference in Red Cloud, Nebraska. She paints not what one wishes the Great Plains to be, but what they actually are. Endless. Seemingly monotonous. Vast. Vast squared. Vast cubed. I wish I had a room in my house 50 feet long so I could buy one of her extraordinary paintings. I adore Catherine Mayer's art. She nails it, as I think nobody else has ever done. The best way to experience the plains is to start from the west and come up over the front range, wherever it happens to be, and suddenly look down on an infinite sea of grass. My favorite vantage points are I-70 west of Denver, but unfortunately... Your viewshed there is crowded with, well, Denver and its many suburbs. Or west of Laramie, Wyoming, much better. But better still, U.S. Highway 2 coming off Glacier National Park towards Browning, Montana. The view of the Great Plains there just takes your breath away. 
among other things, you think, I sure hope my car doesn't break down out there in that endless space between me and Minnesota. I met a man in the coal hills of eastern Kentucky once who asked where I was from. When I said North Dakota, he looked at me for a while and then said, Yup, that's a lot of country all spread out. Precisely. North Dakota's favorite son, Eric Severide, one of my heroes, wrote, In distant cities, when someone would ask, Where are you from? and I would answer, North Dakota, they would merely nod politely and change the subject, having no point of common reference. It was a large, rectangular, blank spot in the nation's mind. A large, rectangular, blank spot in the nation's mind. North Dakota made Severide shudder. Shuddering is one of the most important of all human actions. The more you think about it, the more interesting it is that certain things cause us involuntarily to regroup our bodies and minds with a sudden, violent withdrawal of our boundaries inward. If you cannot find God when you are alone on the Great Plains, you probably can't find him or her at all, because there is nothing there but grass at your feet, sky arching endlessly overhead, and you a featherless biped who could not survive very long without some serious industrial climate control. Maybe a pronghorn antelope staring curiously at you before dashing to the lip of the horizon just for fun, apparently. When I need to pray hard, I go to Bear Butte in South Dakota, sacred to the Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Crow, among others, and climb up to the easy Great Plains summit and sit for a couple of hours in empty timelessness. I have said that films never do justice to the Great Plains, but here are a few that might get you close. Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando's Missouri Breaks does some of it. The independent film Northern Lights about the Radical Nonpartisan League back in 1917 in North Dakota has a heartbreakingly beautiful harvest scene in an actual blizzard. And the just-released Woman Walking Ahead about the New York artist and philanthropist Catherine Weldon's relationship with Sitting Bull in the months before his assassination has remarkably beautiful glimpses of the plains at times, even though it was not filmed here in North Dakota. And it stars Jessica Chastain, who embodies another form of enormous beauty. It really is the case that you have to see it to come to terms with it. So come to the Great Plains. For a price, we can blindfold you and show you the new Enlightenment Radio Network barn. The Little Missouri River Valley is sacred to me and was once sacred to the people of North Dakota before filthy lucre, in the form of fracking, transubstantiated our hearts into cold, hard cash. It is still mostly intact. If you drive Montana Highway 200 west of Sydney, you will either find God or hang yourself somewhere between Jordan and Circle, Montana. And you may meet the amazing Catherine Mayer out there with her giant canvas in one of the last untouched places in the Western Hemisphere. I should live somewhere else because I want a community of book-loving, land-sensitive, open-minded, tolerant, conversation-adept, and soul-alert lovers of the humanities. But hey... I've got friends all over the place, some of them listening to me at this moment, and a very big library, including a brand new hardcover edition in 30 volumes of the complete works of Charles Dickens. If you are lonely in my library, there is no hope for you. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. 
Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.